The English right-wing establishment's current demonisation of Scots, who, remember, actually voted no to separation, is largely about an attempt to define English national identity on their own divisive terms. It's now very little to do with Scotland. For many, that country seems to have become a mere tool in a covert battle for the soul of Englishness. Of course, it's also the narrative of simpletons. Anything that inverts cause and effect generally is. If you believe that the previously harmonious and prosperous UK is being derailed and undermined by Scottish malcontents, then you're either an irredeemable idiot, or at best, chronically out of touch with historical reality. Scots haven't so much been wrecking or even rejecting Britain as watching it being dismantled around them. As this has been happening, they've wisely been getting on with building their own nation. This isn't the mad demolition spree rabidly and fearfully spewed out by the London media mouthpieces of billionaire proprietors. That carnage happened long ago, to the post-war consensus that formed the backbone of Britain. Without it, all we have is Trident and G7 strutting on the world catwalks as an expensive no-win vanity contest on America's next top model bomb builder. For the Scots, it's been simple pragmatism. Our house is falling down, so let's build another one, and on more enlightened design principles, with democracy and accountability, without an inbuilt avaricious elite that hoovers up everything, leaving the rest of us the crumbs that very occasionally fall from the table. The ongoing Scottish independence campaign is a response to such factors. It's not, or at least only incidentally, down to the bloody mindedness of Scots asserting their democratic rights. The notion that political momentum and forces owing themselves to economic and structural factors can be settled by a one-off vote is highly erroneous. When I wrote about the aftermath of the referendum for The Guardian, in order to file it in time, I had to roughly pre-compose two pieces, one assuming a yes and the other a no. The yes piece was actually a bit boring. When you got past the euphoria and triumph, it would be about hangovers, lawyers and the prosaic trials ahead. The no scenario was far more intriguing, as the issue, failing a definitive Debo Max settlement which obviously never came, would be unresolved. Every election, UK, European, Scottish, local, would all, in some form, be a rerun of this debate and therefore a continuation of the independence process. Thus, every victory on the issue of the UK ruling class and its lackeys merely unleashes a new set of potentially exhaustive considerations. Every response feeds into and becomes part of a developing story. The reality is that almost everyone is engaged in rebuilding the separatist state of New Scotland and England, even the Sun, with its English edition virulently anti-SNP and its Scottish one mildly and respectfully pro. Our resident fascists, the Scottish Defence League, would a few years back have been part of a British Defence League. Then, they would have been able to indulge in the United cross Cheviot bashing of whatever latest minority has destroyed the British way of life. Now, they are de facto, not wanted in the EDL and have to go it alone, albeit with fraternal support from their southern brethren. When those sorts of institutions are hammering nails into the coffin of British national consciousness, it pretty much says it's game over. The flabby, corpulent, greater Englandism of the establishment might not be able to fit into that Union Jack dress anymore. But England itself still has to make its choice on its model of national identity. My hunch is that the EU referendum, not the vote but the debate, could be the watershed. If it has a long lead-in time, then the real substantive arguments, not just for and against the EU as both an ideal and in its current mess, but what English identity and political aspiration actually is, might just gain traction over the tiresome and destructive media-hyped wog star in Calais and now apparently Hadrian's Wall hysteria. On Scotland, as with Europe, there is no doubt which brand of nationalism the UK establishment would like the English populace to embrace. But so what? Let Cameron have his referendum. The process in Scotland backfired by igniting a generation of Scots to new political possibilities. Give England its own opportunity for self-definition. The deranged and inflammatory rants of Hastings, Maisie, Bell and the Sun, Mail and Telegraph constitutes only one aspect of this equation. As the largest country in the imperial adventure and principal home to a corrupt UK establishment which, from cover-ups to its organised paedophilia, phone-tapping and Hillsborough lies, to its off-the-scale avaricious greed is shown to be more unspeakably vile almost daily. England, understandably, has a greater struggle than Scotland to shrug off the negative associations with the imperial past and reassert itself as a post-colonial nation. But the genuine urge to modernise, despite being led up the garden path by New Labour and Blairism, is at least as strong as the deluded desire to turn the clock back to some rose-tinted version of Victoriana. 
Not everybody is inclined to sit back complacently as a secretive elite is granted immunity to expropriate the nation's wealth and kiddie fiddle while London burns under the white heat of global property prices. The fear and subsequent vilification of the vibrant Scots independence movement by entrenched elites is only tangentially to do with the Scots losing Scotland. Yes, authoritarian politicians of the imperialist and proprietary mindset never like to lose their territory, whether measured in Tory land or Labour votes. Of course, it's also about legacy and not on my watch politics. I would seriously doubt that there are any senior Westminster politicians who are intellectually convinced of the long-term viability of the UK in its current form. However, the real fear for the establishment is that the Scottish independence will spark the calls for the genuine reform of politics in the rest of the UK, which would really undermine their entrenched power and privilege. The establishment's big fear is that the English bulldog might just turn on their master who is constantly mistreating it, rather than waste time and energy barking at the Scots Terrier across the fence. In the meantime, the predictable Greater England establishment response to the decline of Britain only serves to keep the Scottish independence bandwagon accelerating. Any Scot who believes in independence can't argue against the principle of English votes on English laws. This in turn pushes out the separation envelope further. Eventually, England's politicians will back themselves into addressing the question many English people are now rightly asking. Why are we even bothering with all of this? The idea that patching up a disintegrating union is more trouble than it's worth, and thank you very much Scotland, but we have better things to be getting on with, must surely, and justifiably, be implanting itself in English minds. The perfectly natural and reasonable response is light years removed from Alan Maisie's power light Culloden Bannockburn fantasies of the Thames running red with blood. The north of England is probably the key. The most industrialised region of the UK is the last part to emotionally jettison the concept of an inclusive Britishness. Danny Boyle's Olympic ceremony could probably only have been devised by a northerner. Paul Mason recently posited in The Guardian that there were now three UK geopolitical mindsets. Scandi Scotland and the wealthy South East, which were confident in their voices and objectives, caught between this was post-industrial Britain, and it's these voices that so desperately need to be heard, as they will be crucial in the shaping and the defining of the future England. Ed Miliband seems set to fail at delineating and renewing this England, for much the same reason Blairism did post-Clause 4. The party is essentially devoid of guiding principles other than two main cardinal propositions of New Labour. 1. Attain office at all costs through staying in the centre ground. 2. Do not, under any circumstances, speak the truth to real power. Cajole, beg, flatter and seduce, yes, but never, ever confront. Perhaps instead of worrying about what the rancid right of the mainstream media are saying, Labour and England should be moving with the times and taking note of the more progressive factions both within and outside of their party. In the long run, the left challenge to Labour in England could come from more than just the Greens. The new English identity might be a regionalist one. The North East Party and Yorkshire First now join the long-established Cornish and West Country advocacy parties of Meb Colonel and the Wessex Regionalists. Those small but ambitious groups in the north of England know the roadmap of getting the establishment, both Tory and Labour, to pay heed is the one crammed out in broad strokes by the SNP and by Plaid Cymru in Wales. This is crudely put to jettison Labour and its careerist dependency on Westminster and chart your own course. Ironically, if the Labour Party south of the border decides to embrace a role as a viable progressive left-leaning party of an emerging civic English nationalism, they could do worse than model themselves on the post-referendum SNP. The demise of British nationalism means that Labour's Scottish ship has probably sailed for good. They sank it themselves by throwing their lot in with the limited Tory Greater England UK and fighting to preserve its elitist and antiquated political structures. The sadness for Labour is that one of the most catastrophic political strategy calls of our time was made with no discussion and debate and was inevitable, given what the party had become, a myopic slave to the Westminster game. Polls can be wrong, leads can be eroded, but whether the SNP enjoy an avalanche or just a paltry landslide, it is likely that the referendum campaign was seismic. It's unlikely that there will be any return to what the bemused rump of Scottish Labour strugglers often hope to cite as normal, i.e. a two-party two Westminster politics. The longer into April the poll gap remains, the more Miliband will write off Scotland with a Blairite pitch to the south, seeking to be the party for all England, more unwitting nation-building. 
Whatever the SNP do, with 100,000 members, three quarters of them post-referendum, it's now to all intents and purposes a new party. England still has its own moves to make. Labelling Scots as the latest enemy within isn't going to alter those broader economic and structural issues shaping the UK and its redesign as an instrument of expropriating the wealth of its citizens for the super rich. It can only, at best, offer a temporary distraction from the big choices ahead. Scotland as an issue might seem an increasingly persistent and urgent one to English people, but in a country where practically everybody other than the very rich lead a life full of struggle, burdened with debt and job and financial insecurity, it's far from the most crucial. The main problem is a variation on an old one. If the English people don't make their voices heard, the establishment will do it on their behalf. We will always hear the whining, exasperated Tory right, UKIP, Jeremy Clarkson for crying out loud how much more do we have to take voices for the privileged, loudly coming to terms with the realisation that despite their material wealth and indulged status, they fundamentally remain petty, miserable, uptight and resentful specimens. That is a given constant in English social life. The voice of power will always make itself heard through the mainstream media, even, especially, when it has nothing fresh or interesting to say. And they will always assume to speak for England, but of course they don't, they only speak for themselves. The ideological battle for Britain is over, Thatcher saw to that, and all we're doing is indulging in Savalesque corpse fucking by pretending it ain't so. But the battle of England is just beginning. As in all matters relating to that wonderful country, I'm on the side of the good guys. So there we have it. There's bits in there that I don't agree with, but for the most part, very succinctly put, and he makes some very good points. Thanks very much for listening. Let me know what you think. Please like, comment, and share. So there we have it. There's bits in there that I don't agree with, but for the most part, very succinctly put, and he makes some very good points. Thanks very much for listening. Let me know what you think. Please like, comment, and share. So there we have it. There's bits in there that I don't agree with, but for the most part, very succinctly put, and he makes some very good points. Thanks very much for listening. Let me know what you think. Please like, comment, and share.